Hello, hello, hello. If you or anyone you know has ever suffered from fatigue, you're going to want to listen today. I'm Jane Hogan, the wellness engineer and natural pain relief expert. I was a real engineer for 30 years until the pain from rheumatoid arthritis told me I had to make a change. Along the way, I discovered a whole lot of other things. Now I love to help people relieve their pain naturally. And this show, Wellness by Design, is all about intentional living so that you can leave pain behind and be the person you were meant to be and not miss out on anything because of pain. I'm really excited today to have Dr. Evan Hirsch on the show. Welcome, Dr. Evan. Jane, thanks so much for having me on. I'm really thrilled because I know the work that you do with fatigue is just so helpful. It's such a common problem. And I know that um, what you're going to say today and share with my audience is really valuable. So I'm, I'm really thrilled. I'm going to read your bio because I want people to know all about you. So here you go. Dr. Evan Hirsch is a world-renowned fatigue expert and is the founder and CEO of the International Center for Fatigue. He suffered with fatigue for five years before he achieved resolution using the Fix Your Fatigue program that he pioneered in his medical practice. Through his best-selling book, podcast, and online programs, he has helped thousands of people around the world optimize their energy naturally, what I love, and he is on a mission to help one million more. He is a board certified in integrative medicine, and when he's not in the office, you can find him singing musicals, dancing, and playing basketball with the family. Uh, Evan, sounds so fun. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good life. Yes, yes, wonderful. Well, now that you don't have fatigue, it's a really good life, right? Made so a huge tell, difference, yeah. tell me about your background and how you had this fatigue and then for five years and then how you figured out how to overcome it. Yeah, so when I started my residency in, in Olympia, Washington, I was just I was coming out of medical school. I was already interested in holistic medicine, started my residency, got board certified in holistic medicine, graduated, started my own practice, and was already practicing functional medicine within the first year. And two years later, I got chronic fatigue and I could barely get out of bed. I had at that point 10 employees and 4,000 square feet of office space. And I had to keep hiring people to do my job because I could barely, my brain fog was so bad. I couldn't remember the patient sitting in front of me and I could only work for a couple hours a day. We had a new baby at home. My wife who had just gotten over her fatigue a couple of years prior um, needed my help with the dishes. I couldn't, you know? And so I had a lot of guilt. I had a lot of shame around that. And I finally, instead of started blaming the things outside of myself, started looking inward and thinking about, okay, what can I do? And I knew from a functional medicine perspective that if I found the root causes of my fatigue, that I would have success. But what I didn't realize was that there were 33 different root causes of fatigue and that everybody had multiple causes and everybody has different multiple causes. So I went through and as I found a new cause, and this was from reading books and going to lectures and conferences and whatnot, and out looking for every single potential cause, I would find a cause, I would assess it in myself, figure out if I had it. And if I did, I would fix it. And it's kind of like removing nails out of the bottom of your foot. I had like 30 different nails in the bottom of my foot. And every single time I pulled another nail out, I would get a little bit better. But it was only when I got all of them out that I really achieved the best health and energy of my life. Oh my goodness. Incredible. Uh, well, first of all, I, I love that you were practicing functional medicine. That's my background as a health coach. I'm a functional medicine health coach, but getting at the root cause is, you know, always so important, but it, it's kind of insidious when for something like fatigue, it's so general and there's so many different root causes. How did you how did you nail like nail down well you're talking about nails too nail down that those ones that you the 30 that did you say 30 you had i had 30 out of the 33 causes and 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 it really just took broadening my differential you know we have a saying that i learned in medical school which is if you don't think about it you're not going to diagnose it 
Mm-hmm. And it's so true. If you don't have, if you're not looking at all of these different causes and people don't get overwhelmed, we could actually just be talking about these as like 10 different categories of causes. We don't have to say 33. All you have to know is that you just need to move through a process, a systematic process yes. to determine all of the causes that you have. Now, fortunately, I found that 75%, so three quarters of all of those causes can be determined by your symptoms alone. Oh, that helps narrow it down. Yeah. And so when people join our program and they start going through step one, which is to figure out the causes that they have within an hour or so, they will know 75% of their causes, which, you know, you fix just those 75, you're going to be feeling so much better. You know, you're basically removing 75% Mm -hmm. of those nails out of the bottom of your feet. Mm -hmm. And then you can really focus in on those other 25% that require labs in order to determine which causes those are so that you can get rid of all of them completely. So interesting. I really love this systematic uh, approach, (laughs) you know, really like, you know, we're, you're on a path then. So, you know, okay, I got to do this and then I can do that. And then people can see that there's a process and a way through it to figure out their fatigue. So can we go a little bit deeper into what though, though you said 75% of them fall into these particular categories. Can we go a little bit deeper into those? Absolutely. And, and actually, let's take, let's just go into all of the causes. And then I can talk about kind of like which ones you can determine just based off of your symptoms. So when we look at all of these causes, we'll talk about the 10 categories of causes. Um, we can really divide them up into deficiencies. So things that aren't in the body that are supposed to be there. Oh. And toxicities. So things that are in the body that aren't supposed to be there. Right. And so when we're looking at the deficiencies, we're looking at deficiencies in hormones. So these are things like the adrenal gland produces something called cortisol as well as adrenaline hormones. It's a little triangular gland sits on top of the kidneys and is responsible for our get up and go managing blood sugars and all sorts of other things. This is one that we can assess based off of symptoms. The other hormones are things like thyroid and sex hormones, which also those things can also be based off of symptoms. You know, this is one of the reasons why a lot of people have thyroid issues, and they're being undertreated. I would say 90% of everybody who has thyroid issues is being undertreated by their practitioner, because they're, they're paying more attention to the labs than they are to their symptoms. If the person sitting in front of you has low thyroid symptoms, but the labs look normal, Mm. You know, the, oftentimes the practitioner isn't going to do anything, but what they really need is they need additional thyroid support. So adrenals, thyroid, sex hormones, like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and then deficiencies in mitochondrial function, which is the energy center of every mm. cell in the body it produces mm. about 70 to 80% of our energy and gets squashed by all of these toxicities. And I should say that big picture majority of these deficiencies are actually consequences of the toxicities. So this process really is all about getting rid of the toxicities, but we can't go straight at them in step one or step two. We actually have to do that in step four. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit, but that's kind of what this process is all about. um, Boosting up the deficiencies and removing those toxicities. Mm. So we talked about deficiencies in hormones, deficiencies in mitochondria, There's deficiencies in nutrients like low vitamins and minerals. These usually have to be done by laboratory tests. Deficiencies in neurotransmitters, which can be done um, by symptoms. And this is like low serotonin if you're depressed or anxious, low GABA if you're anxious or panicked, low dopamine if you don't have good focus and have depression. Um, And then there's deficiencies in lifestyle habits, you know, which is one of the biggest things that people can do right now at home, you know, drink more water, eat more good food, get more sleep and get more movement. Now, a lot of the people that I work with who are chronically fatigued, they can't really do a lot of movement. So it's kind of figuring out your what I call your Goldilocks dose. You know, how much movement can you get? That's not going to make you feel worse. Right. Yeah. So those are all the deficiencies. Any questions on those before I move on to the toxicities? Um, well, I'd like to, but maybe we'll do this afterwards uh, for people that are listening. Like, what are the symptoms? So if you think that's better covered after you go through the steps, then we can do it then. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. All right. Let's go to the next step. 
So then in terms of the toxicities, we're looking at heavy metal toxicity. So Mm -hmm. 100,000 pounds of mercury are dumped into our oceans every single year. And so we're anything that comes out of the ocean that we're consuming, we're getting exposure. This, you know, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency in the States, uh, actually said that, you know, tuna fish was no longer recommended for pregnant women a couple of years ago. It was initially, you know, once a week was okay. And then once a month was okay. And then once every couple of months, and then it was you know, actually no. And this is just because of the amount of mercury that's found. The bigger the fish, the more fat, the more mm-hmm. mercury, unfortunately. You know, 70% of all lipsticks uh, have lead in them. You know, so there's just a lot of heavy metals that we're exposed to on a regular basis. Then there's chemicals. So 84,000 different chemicals that we're exposed to regularly that haven't been appropriately evaluated by government bodies. Some stats say that, you know, before you even leave the house, you've been exposed to somewhere between two and 500 different chemicals in the form of shampoos and cosmetics and pesticides in your foods and whatnot. So important to pay attention to these things. And then there's molds. So about half of the buildings in all first world countries And by the way, it's not all bad news, right? We'll get to the good news later. But over half of the buildings in all first first world countries have water damage and most of those have molds. So a lot of people will say, no, there's absolutely no chance that I have mold in my body. But then when we get down to it, they're like, actually, I did live in a home once upon a time that had a busted pipe, had a roof leak, had flooding in the basement, because all it takes is just one home that you lived in. And then it you get, you end up getting mold and mycotoxins in your body. So that's an important one for people to look at. And then there's, um, so we did heavy metals, chemicals, molds, infections are a big one, you know, Mm. where the CDC a couple of years ago changed their tune where they said, actually, it's not 30,000 new cases of Lyme per year. It's actually 300,000. And that doesn't include Epstein-Barr virus and all the other co-infections like Babesia and Bartonella and and anaplasma and whatnot. So very important. And a lot of this can be really determined based off of the symptoms, which we'll definitely get into in a little bit, because I think that's probably one of the most important parts of this talk is to help people mm-hmm. figure out if they have an infection that's causing their fatigue. That's a huge part of this. Mm-hmm. So we talked about heavy metals, chemicals, molds, infections, and then allergies like food allergies or inhalant allergies things like negative emotional patterns. So anything that you've experienced in your life that changes the way that you look at life in a negative way, changes the way that you look at relationships, whether it was rejection or any sort of, you know, it doesn't have to be known harm. It doesn't have to be any sort of abuse. It can be anything less than nurturing is going to end up causing stress on the human organism and you have to retrain your brain. And so this is one of the reasons why we have a nervous system retraining coach on staff, why we focus a lot on mindset and mindfulness and meditation, why we offer meditations to our folks as well. So an important part of the program, yeah. Mm. And then the last one is electromagnetic fields. So all these invisible rays that we're exposed to on a regular basis, anything that has a battery, anything that you're plugging into the wall, all of these things, um, these invisible rays will damage the DNA and damage DNA can end up metamorphosizing or metamorphing into um, what's called metaplasia, which is why I was thinking about that word, and then into dysplasia and potentially cancer. So this is, it's very important to make sure that we're avoiding those things as much as possible. So that's, those are those 10 categories of causes, the, the deficiencies and the toxicities. Goodness. I mean, you know, when we, we sit down and think about all that, like just in a short period of time, it seems a little almost depressing. Uh, but the, the thing is that there's a lot we can do about it, right? I learned this along my own path as well. I started looking at all these different things and realized, okay, once you, once you get um, inflamed, you, you have to, you have to deal with these, you kind of can't ignore them. So do you think part of it is that um, people get, they have a get like a uh, base level of inflammation, and then they're more susceptible to things like viruses and parasites and, and so on? Do you think that's the case, Evan? Absolutely. And a lot of that has to do with immune system function. So if you have heavy metals, chemicals, and molds, they're going to take the immune system 
and distract it off into left field and the infections are going to become opportunistic because a lot of these yeah. bugs are actually already in the body. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes there's some sort of inoculation that we get either from a tick bite, a mosquito, a chigger, um, being intimate with somebody who has them, or you get it vertically through the placenta from mom since birth. But we're really in this human form, we're 90% bug cells and 10% human cells. I know that always blows my mind whenever I hear that. It's kind of crazy. Uh, and I've heard uh, some people say that we're really like the meat cakes for, the, uh, for all of the microorganisms to travel uh, the world. <laughs> but exactly. we don't think of ourselves like that. Uh, we also don't really, you know, really the whole microbiome is fairly new. We didn't really know that we had all these organisms for so long and how important they are. We need them to survive as well. It's not like we don't want to get rid of them. We need them to survive. They're part of our, they're part of our, our humanness. Exactly. We just have to keep them in balance. And when we have a number of these toxicities that burden the liver, that burden and distract the immune system, then all of a sudden these bugs can be, become opportunistic. And so, you know, the process is a more natural one because, you know, we're not, you know, heavy hammer trying to kill these things and eradicate them forever. We're trying to remove all of the toxicities that have hijacked the immune system so we can bring the immune system back into balance we can decrease the amount of the infections present and recreate that balance mm -hmm. yeah so remove some of those so that the body can do what it's made to do and heal naturally it will heal right. naturally given the right environment Amen. so i love that you talked about um those the categories so um the steps I think we covered the steps. So the first step was um, identify, right? Right, yep. First step is to figure out the causes that the person has. Right. So in the way that we do that is we have a workbook that people use going through the program and they're going through the checklist and they're determining based off of their symptoms. And if they have any labs, they can look at how to interpret those labs and how those labs play in. But for the most part, their their first swath going through is going to be looking at all of their causes. Then they get 75% of their causes and then they can order their labs to determine the other causes. Mm, great. The, so that's the first step. The second step then is to, and I should big, take a step back again, remind people like this is all about step four, which is removing the toxicities. Okay. But we, we can't do step four and step two. And the reason why is because we have to make you as strong as possible in step two by boosting all of the deficiencies. Right. Makes sense. And, and then we have to open up the detoxification pathways so that when we start grabbing the toxicities in step four and pulling them out of the tissues and into the bloodstream, they have to have a place to go. They have to be able to get out of the body. Otherwise, they're just going to go into a different compartment. And then you haven't done anything except for exacerbate the situation and cause problems. And so step two is boosting those deficiencies, adrenals, mitochondria, thyroid. I call those the big three because they're kind of, they help to make the biggest shift in people's energy right. along with replacing the vitamin B12 and vitamin D and neurotransmitters and lifestyle habits. And then opening up those detoxification pathways in the intestines, making sure you're getting one at least, but hopefully two bowel movements a day making sure that you're um, flushing out the lymph, which is the garbage system of the body, the liver and the kidney, which are these filters that really need to be wrung out and, and supported. And then the glymphatic system, which is basically the brain lymph. So you can dump the brain lymph into the body lymph, the, the body lymph into the liver and the kidneys and the intestines. So you can pee, poop, sweat, breathe all these toxins out. And then right. going into step four, where then it's time to actually pull these toxins out at a very slow and steady pace so that you can, you can keep up with the amount that with how open these pathways are, because if you try to pull out too much too fast, guess what? Overflow, you feel worse. Yeah. So it's got to be at the right rate. I don't think a lot of people realize that, you know, they hear this detox, right? And, and don't realize that there, there are these steps that you have to do ahead of time so that your body can handle that detox because a lot of these, when they're stored in the tissues, you know, they're, I don't know if it's safe there, but temporarily that's where they are. But when they come out, we start 
the body has to deal with it again. So that's great. That's the four steps. So let's look at symptoms now because if people are listening, they're wondering, I mean, people know when they're fatigued, right? They, they don't have any energy, but they may not be linking all of these things up together. So let's hear about the symptoms you're talking about and, and yeah, we, how, which they line up with. Yeah, let's start off first with adrenals. So the adrenal okay. gland, like I mentioned, little triangular gland sits on top of the kidneys, produces cortisol as well as other things. One of the main symptoms that people will experience is a hard time getting out of bed. Yes. They'll also experience a crash somewhere between two and four o'clock in the afternoon. And these are adrenal times, you know, adrenals and cortisol specifically starts pr being produced at midnight. It peaks at 6 a.m. And then it kind of comes down throughout the day. If that isn't correct, where it's kind of like up and down throughout the day, then you end up um, crashing throughout the day. And then it also messes with your sleep. So you're actually up and down at night. In yeah. fact, I get actually more people to sleep by giving them things in the morning yes. than by giving them anything at night. And it's because most sleep issues are a circadian rhythm problem, right. where basically you don't have enough support in the morning. Mm -hmm. So coming back to the adrenals, we're talking about lightheadedness when you're going from a sitting to a standing position. And this has to do with the fact that the adrenals also produce something called aldosterone that manages the salt balance in the body. And consequently, there's something called the osmotic gradient, but you end up getting a decrease in, the, in your blood pressure and you, where you can't compensate when you go from a sitting or a lying down to a standing position, all of a sudden you see black or you see stars or whatever, because your blood flow is not enough getting up to the brain. Okay. So that's another symptom that people experience. And then the, the insomnia where either people are having a hard time falling asleep, a hard time staying asleep. That's also a common one. And then people having cravings for saltiness or sweetness. And both of those have to do with the aldosterone and salt and how it balances salt. And then also cortisol and how it balances insulin and blood sugars, where oftentimes this is one of the reasons why we crave sugar is oftentimes because our cortisol isn't present and the way that it's affecting insulin and blood sugars is that the body is saying, I need more sugar because I don't have enough energy that's present. So those are some of the symptoms of the adrenals. And then in terms of symptoms of thyroid, we're talking about a hard time losing weight or continuing to gain weight, hair loss or loss of hair on the latter, latter third of the eyebrow on the outside part of the eyebrow. We're talking about... Um, gosh, what else? Cold hands and cold feet. Mm -hmm. So if you have a lot of these symptoms, it's very likely that you have thyroid. And that's one of those things that subjectively, you can really start increasing your thyroid dose. You're going to know if you get too much thyroid, because all of a sudden you're going to start getting heart palpitations and tremors. And you feel like you just drank a big pot of coffee. Now I wouldn't recommend doing this on your own. Definitely work with a practitioner. Otherwise it can feel very scary and you don't know what's happening, but it is very safe in order to work your way up on thyroid and actually get to your optimal dose because when thyroid's working better and adrenals and mitochondria are working better, you know, everything else works better, which is why that it's really there in step two. So you're talking about thyroid medication there? Either thyroid medication or thyroid glandulars or certain um, herbs like ashwagandha that have been shown to significantly improve thyroid function. So there's, there's a number of different components that can be used in order to improve thyroid function. And what's important to remember too, is that is the order in which you replace these, because actually thyroid gets better when you replace mitochondrial function which is the energy center of every cell in the body, like I talked about, but it's also responsible for getting thyroid into the cells. So you can have thyroid floating around in the, in the body, in the bloodstream, but it's not going to get into the cells unless the mitochondria is functioning appropriately. Oh. And then the adrenals help with the thyroid function as well. So you boost your adrenals, then you boost your mitochondria, and then, you're, and then your thyroid is functioning better. And so you're not you're not overdoing it on the thyroid because you're already having that additional support. Mm. And do you recommend, um, you know, doing things like stress reduction techniques before even trying any medications or, or natural uh, supplements? 
it's always a nice compliment. You know, people want to get better faster. So I find that combining the two can really be great. So it really just depends on what people's goals are. If they want to do it all natural, you know, just with lifestyle, mindset, mindfulness, you know, it takes a while to reset limiting beliefs to start to look at your life in a different way. So while that's happening, we like to boost up people's energy because it's always a combination of your emotions, your, your deficiencies, your toxicities. And so that's why it's so, that's why we, we, we do our best to address every single potential cause, because we know that if we leave no stone unturned, we're going to be successful. I don't think people realize, you know, the general public, how big a role emotions play in our physical health it's and and as you talked about these limiting beliefs that are hidden we can't see them we don't we're not aware of them but yet they are there in the background running things and actually changing our our physical body it's it's such an important point you're making there dr evans so thank you so much for bringing that up yeah well you know 80 percent of our thoughts are negative 80%. 80%. And so we have to be unthinking these thoughts on a regular basis. You know, that's why the first things that we teach are gratitude, you know, good research on three gratitudes a day starts yeah. to reprogram. There's something called neuroplasticity where the brain is, is plastic just in the way that it's able to change. And so we really want to change the brain, retrain the brain by starting to feel these gratitudes. So we're grateful for what we have in life, no matter where we are. Um, and then we look at visualizations, you know, like visualizing what you want in the future and then looking at what sort of limiting beliefs do you have and flipping them on their head and actually making them into empowering beliefs. And then looking at the negative questions that we're asking ourselves, like, why is this happening to me? That's a very disempowering question. We want to flip it on its head and instead ask empowering questions like, what can I do today in order to move myself forward? How can I love my family and myself even more today? Right? Those are empowering questions. And so they're such an important part of this work. And you can't not do the emotional work and expect to get better. You have to do the emotional work in addition to the physical work. So true. So true. I heard Dr. Datis Karazi, and you're probably familiar with him, sure. say that if you don't deal with that, you will never fully get better. You know, it doesn't matter what you do with all these addressing the physical, you have to deal with underlying emotions. And uh, to hear that from, you know, from any medical doctors is great to hear because it, it really drives it home for people to understand that it's such an important part of healing. So thanks so much for that. All right, so we're, um, we are still talking about symptoms. Yeah, so let's go into infections because I think that's really some of the most important symptoms. So, uh, you know, a lot of people wonder if they have Lyme disease. Lyme disease found in, in Lyme, Connecticut, which is how it got the name by Dr. Bergdorf, who was the pathologist who figured it out that there was this, um, this spirochete, this spiraling bacteria that was found in this tick. And so it's named Borrelia burgdorferi after Bergdorf. And so Borrelia, you really can't have Borrelia if you don't have two particular symptoms. One is the symptom of symptoms coming and going, where you have some good days better than others, where some days are just bad and you don't know what days those are going to be. So sometimes it's hard to schedule something, you know, schedule something, uh, an appointment or a call with a friend or whatever it is, because you don't know how you're going to feel. The other thing is you have to have symptoms that move around the body. So this could be muscle pain, joint pain, or nerve pain that one day or one week, it's like in the shoulder. And then next week or the next day, it's in the knee. So it's this pain that's moving around the body. There are very few things that do that. And so if you have that symptom and symptoms come and go, it's very likely you have Borrelia. Mm. Babesia is known as the North American malaria. And this intracellular organism, so it gets inside the cell, oftentimes will cause spontaneous sweating. It's usually cyclical. So sometimes you'll have sweating every day. Sometimes you'll have sweating once a week. Sometimes you'll have sweating once a month. It can happen during the day. It can happen at night. Sometimes you don't have sweating, but sometimes you just feel really hot where 
you're like, why, this is not hot flashes. Why do I have, why do I feel this heat? You know, if you're younger than 50 and you're experiencing it, or if you're older than 50 and you know what hot flashes feel like, you'll be like, gosh, this is not hot flashes, but I'm all of a sudden I'm feeling hot. Oftentimes these are people who are outside in Newfoundland in the winter, shoveling snow and they got a t-shirt on. They're the warmest person in the room and they're always asking you to turn up the AC. Right. They also have generally a cough or shortness of breath or something going on with the lungs, some sort of lung tickle, it seems like. And then their sleep is generally awful, unfortunately, where they have a hard time falling asleep and or staying asleep. And then usually these people have anxiety to the point of panic attacks and depression to the point of suicidal thoughts. Oh, wow. Terrible. So, it's so, yeah, so really terrible. And unfortunately, when people do commit suicide, when they have Lyme and it's co-infections, it's usually because they have Babesia. Wow. Now, okay. the last one that I'd love to talk about, if yeah. I can right quick, is Bartonella. So Bartonella usually has some misdiagnoses along with it. So there's pain on the bottom of the feet, usually misdiagnosed as plantar fasciitis. So if you've been diagnosed with that, it could very well be Bartonella instead. Um, oftentimes the body pain, the muscle pain that people have is misdiagnosed as fibromyalgia. People will oftentimes have migraines. They'll have a hard time sleeping and they'll have anxiety and depression, but not as bad as Babesia. And then oftentimes they'll have stretch marks or like these, what we call Bartonella striae, where you're like, gosh, I haven't been had any fluctuations in weight, but here I have, you know, these scratch marks or these stretch marks that are persistent on the flank, on the butt, on the legs, on the belly, wherever it is. And then oftentimes these people have thyroid issues, which get better when we treat the Bartonella. Oh, and last one is muscle cramps. And if, even if the muscle cramps get better with water or magnesium or potassium, if you've got muscle cramps, you've got pain on the feet, you've got a problem sleeping, then oftentimes you're going to have Bartonella. And you don't have to have all those symptoms that I mentioned for each one of those, but three to four of them is enough of a conglomeration of symptoms where you can really determine that you have these symptoms. And even the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, teach that these symptoms are, that these bugs are actually based on clinical diagnoses more so than labs. Labs are less consistent, but having this conglomeration of symptoms is more diagnostic than having a lab. Interesting. So I hope that if there's people listening, like trying to piece together what symptoms they may be experiencing, that they've gotten some little bit of direction from you on where they could go next. So, um, all right. So general, general fatigue, if it's not a parasite, what, like, what are the first steps you get people to do? Well, I know you got your four step program, but in terms of lifestyle, what, what kind of things can people do to help improve fatigue? Yeah. So the first thing is always to look at lifestyle for the most part. You now, now in our program, the reason why I didn't mention it first is because sometimes people can't change their lifestyle because they're so tired. And so sometimes they need some of the support in the form of supplements, and then they're able to, they feel better, they got some more energy, then they can start changing their lifestyle. But we, we always want to look at food, right? And so oftentimes people are consuming foods that aren't good for them. So ideally, meat and vegetables is, is the diet, is the food plan that people want to consume, where half of your plate is vegetables. You can also have some fruit, but you want to have more vegetables than fruit and then have some protein as well. Grains, dairy, gluten, soy, corn, like you wanna have definitely less of those, less grains, less sugars. That's right. one. Number what two about, is you wanna, go ahead. Oh, uh, you didn't mention fats in there at all. So fats, you always wanna go with good fats, but I find that when you're focused on meat and vegetables that the, the good fats are just gonna be kind of part of that. Right. I mean, yes, you, you know, you don't want to be eating Crisco, but, um, you know, once you, once you start that process and you start getting more of your fats from avocados and, and the good oils, olive oil and avocado oil and coconut oil, um, yeah. nuts and seeds, you're, you're going to be a lot more successful. The challenge though, with fats is that actually sometimes it is hard to get rid of toxins when you're consuming fats. So there'll be periods of time where I actually take a break from fats for a week or so. I haven't heard that before. That's really good to know. 
Okay, yeah. so uh, so that's food, and I know earlier you mentioned water is so important. Yeah, so for people who are going through our program, I tell them you have to be consuming three liters of water a day in order to be successful. So I used to have people just do it based off of their body weight, where half of your body weight in ounces, which still is a pretty good barometer for most people. But for the people who are going through my program who have adrenal issues, have mitochondrial issues, they're actually peeing out a lot of their electrolytes. They actually need more water. So they need three liters of water. Generally, we put a pinch of sea salt in there, actually more than a pinch, depending on how much you you can tolerate how much water you're consuming, but that can really be supportive for the adrenals. But water is, water is a huge component of any program in order to be able to detoxify and, and feed all of the different parts of the body. Okay. And what's your next step uh, or your next component of lifestyle? So then we're looking at sleep. So, you know, you everybody really needs to be sleeping about seven to nine hours per night. You want to make sure that after dinner, you're decreasing the amount of, of exposure to blue light that you have, either wearing blue light blocking glasses or, or putting you know, a number of these different apps that are on your phone or whatever, switching to dark mode. You know, if, you, if your screen looks orange, then you're doing it right because that's actually blocking the blue light. Um, and then you know, making sure you're not watching any horror films or having any sort of arguments in the evening because you want to, everything after dinner really needs to be moving you more towards relaxation, going to sleep at around 10 o'clock at night, um, give or take a half an hour, and then sleeping soundly for six to eight hours in a, in a very dark room where you can barely see your hand in front of your face and making sure that there's no animal that's jumping on you in the middle of the night. Um, that's kind of one of the biggest things that people are like, oh, I absolutely love my cat, you know, but we've got, and we've got a six month old kitten right now. And so if that kitten was jumping on any of us, unfortunately she's not, she would be put in the back part of the house with the 13 year old cat that gets up in the middle of the night and starts meowing. Right. So you have to protect your sleep yes. and you have to get, you know, between seven to nine hours so that you can wake up rejuvenated. I actually just saw a study today where people who consume or who have less than six hours of sleep per night are more likely to get Alzheimer's at age 70. Everyone's so afraid of that. That, that alone might be enough to motivate people. Um, so I know we're getting uh we're getting late on time. So uh, we've covered those three lifestyle um, issue or factors. Is there anything else you want to really highlight? Um, well, in terms of in terms of lifestyle modification, you know, movement is the last one, yeah. you know, where it's it's really important to move and it has to be fun. So, so you true. know, dancing, walking, my family and I just got pedometers so we could be a little bit competitive around who gets the most steps every day, you know, so you have to figure out what's going to be fun for you and your family. And you want to make sure, like I mentioned before, that you find your Goldilocks dose. So if you feel worse because of the amount of exercise that you're doing, and this has thrown a lot of people into long haulers. So we're seeing a lot of those people in our program as well is because exercising is, is stressful. It's good for the body, but it can be stressful. So if your body can't tolerate the stress because your adrenals aren't good, mitochondria, all these toxicities, then you're going to feel worse. So you have to make sure that you're, you're paying attention. If you feel worse after you exercise, you have to decrease either the frequency or the duration. Um, so that's, those are lifestyle. And, and when somebody has a lifestyle problem, we call that a stage one problem, where if you fix the lifestyle problem and they get better, that's a stage one. Um, if they, if you fix lifestyle and then they also need some supplements to replace the deficiency, that's a stage two. And then if they still need to go after the toxicities after that, that's a stage three. And, and those are the most of the people that I'm working with. Cause a lot of people, you know, people working with you, they can work with the lifestyle stuff, replace yeah. some of the deficiencies, but it's really those toxicities that are a lot more challenging, require a lot more time, more complexity. That is really where our program shines. Mm, and the testing to really get the answers, I would think. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so many people do feel better just by addressing lifestyle issues, as you said, but sometimes need to go the next step. Uh, Dr. Evan, this has been so interesting and I know so helpful for the audience. 
where I know you've got a gift for people. It's your ebook, right? So you fix your fatigue ebook. Well, so, it's more than an it's more than an ebook. So this is my best selling okay. book that's on Amazon right now that you can pay eighteen dollars if you want it shipped to your home. Um, but I created a PDF of it, so okay. and I'm just giving that away for free. So it's a it's a three hundred page book, lots of really great references in there, so that you can you can go through it and hopefully it can help some people. I'll share the link to that so people can sign up and, and get it. So I always ask my guests this one last question, and that is. What is one thing someone could do today to improve their health? If they could just pick one thing today. So we've talked about a lot today and I'm going to kind of hem and haw about this, but I would say that the number one thing that you can do today is to eliminate gluten. Mm, uh, so yeah. it's, it's just that it's like eating a sock. I mean, it's completely, the body does not, tolerate it well. And even if you think that you can tolerate it, like you can't really, it's still causing, you know, every bite of gluten that you have can cause inflammation in the body for three to six months. So you definitely want to eliminate that. The other thing I was playing around with was some sort of mindset, something, maybe gratitude, you know, just yeah. start doing a one gratitude per day. But those are, those are the main things. Yeah. So good. I love the way you, you address two things there. One was like the food and, and so on, but the mindset is so important as well. Okay. I, so this has been fantastic, Dr. Erwin. Thank you so much. I know uh, people can find you on your website, which is fixyourfatigue.com. So F I X Y O U R F A T I G U E.com. Okay, and we do have I'll... a Bartonella quiz on there. So you can see Ooh. if you have Bartonella. Oh, what a great idea. Okay. And I'll share all your other social links as well in the notes so people can find you and follow you and learn more about your program and how you help people. And it's such a widespread spread problem. This is great work you are doing in the world. So thank you so much for sharing your knowledge today and for being the guest on Wellness by Design. Thanks for having me on, Jane. Appreciate it. Okay. Bye.